Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Brindley. I'm the CEO and co-founder of um, Music Ally. Uh, we're a digital music research uh, and strategy and business information company. And uh, thank you to Medem for asking me to take part and uh, moderate this panel. We've got a, a great lineup here today, uh, representing different interests, sellers of data, buyers of, of data, users of, of, of data. Um, and um, I'm going to introduce them one by one and, and ask them to talk about you know, their involvement as uh, suppliers or, or users of data. And then I think the idea is, is that we're going to come out fairly early to the audience for questions because, um, you know, we'd really want to be sure that we're answering the questions that are relevant to you. And this is quite a broad topic, um, music as a data-informed business. So please do start thinking about, you know, what you want to ask about. Um, and then we're going to end at uh, about 20 past three, um, and uh, that would leave 10 minutes for actual um, chatting and networking with the panel, okay? So, um, let's get started, and uh, I think if we, um, if we, let's start with Alex at the Next Big Sound, and uh, yeah, please, um, please tell us about, about your business, what, you know, what services you offer, and, and how it works. Hello, Mike Check. Um, thanks to Meetem for having me, and, and uh, looking forward to this panel. Uh, in the audience, raise your hand if you've heard of Next Big Sound before. I'm just trying to get a read of the crowd. So we are a music analytics company. We track the online music activity of every artist in the world, and we sell a centralized dashboard back to music industry professionals that they can use to make decisions that drive their business. I'm the co-founder and CEO. Um, we won Meetem Lab two years ago as the most innovative B2B company, um, and it's been a great uh, time coming back each year. Um, we track data in three main categories, social, sales, and event database. So the social is things like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, Wikipedia, etc. We get sales data from our customers, um, which now include 75% of the recorded music business. So they're giving us every iTunes transaction timestamped and geolocated, every Spotify play, um, dot com numbers, e-commerce, etc. And then event database, so TV appearances, press mentions, live performances, etc. And we marry all those three um, together in one place. And you're making that data available to everyone. So you know, it's not if EMI gives you their data, that's not just available to EMI. It's the pr the public data is available competitively and historically. So we have this going back three years. Um, but if you give us your private data, it's only visible back to you. Right, okay. Um, and tell us a little bit about, you know, what it costs and uh, give us an idea. I know, you know, it's a bit of a big, big kind of question, but just to give us an idea. Of sure. So we have a free product that you can sign up for um, to get free email reports weekly on the social stats. Uh, if you want to upgrade for a suite of applications, it's $20 per artist per month um, at the global enterprise level. Um, these are six-figure contracts. And who are the main clients? I mean, obviously labels, but be beyond that, who, who else is using this? Labels, managers, individual artists, and uh, Billboard licenses two charts from us, the Social 50, which is like the Hot 100, but for social, and the Next Big Sound branded chart, those are both um, their clients of ours. Okay, cool. And, um, and you know, perhaps give us a little bit more of a kind of, you know, a user scenario as to what, what, what's the most valuable usage that you're seeing of this data? I think we've watched a progression. Um, first it was just give me all the data in one place and, and I'll make sense of it. And no sooner had we dragged everything together, um, it was very overwhelming. So a lot of simplification in terms of what numbers you actually should look at to drive your business. We released the findings that uh, Wikipedia profile views um, improve the accuracy of forecasting album sales more than any other uh, data source um, on the social side. And so using that data, when you log in, um, you can make kind of informed marketing decisions, uh, geographic routing, tour routing decisions, um, et cetera. And what, you know, what are you paying for when you're paying for your service? Are you paying really for the convenience, the dashboard, the presentation, the data, or you know, is there sort of you know, other exclusive data 
where you're paying more for the, the actual data that you can't get hold of anywhere else. Yeah, we have uh, Twitter data, so at number, at mentions and retweets. And what we found was the industries evolved from these volume metrics. So total number of Facebook page likes was a big uh, thing that everyone was after, like MySpace plays before that. And now the industry is moving much more in a smart way to engagement numbers. So how many people are talking about, how many people are um, uh, tweeting at the band or retweeting or purchasing, etc. And one great use case is uh, someone who oversees a big artist roster every week pulls out the acts um, rank orders by percentage change week to week in engagement numbers. So anyone over 10% change week to week is then flagged and brought up in a meeting and they go through artist by artist to see, all right, what do we do this week for this act that caused the 15% lift in you know, retweets or whatever? What do we do? Um, and shared learnings across the organization that way. So the core of it really is getting at the ROI around marketing campaigns to see you know, what's effective, what isn't. Is that, is that really, would you say, the, sort of the main benefit of the service? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, um, thanks very much. Um, let's move on now to Jean Litolf, who's the managing director of uh, Nielsen Music. Um, Jean, could you tell us about the kind of data that, that you provide? services that as well. Yes, so we, we haven't won the uh, Medem uh, <laughs> new company award two years ago because we're here for a much longer time actually. And we're monitoring, uh, we're doing several things. First, we're monitoring radio stations across Europe, 17 countries, plus also the US and, and Canada and Mexico. Um, that's one thing, so we listen to what stations are playing and we report on what music they are, uh, they are playing. Uh, two, we're also measuring sales physical sales in the US and a few European countries, digital sales in more than 40 countries. Um, we're also measuring streaming, and both for both sales and streaming, all this information are coming directly from the, the, uh, the company selling, so iTunes, for instance, for sales, uh, Spotify for uh, streaming. Um, and unlike what uh, Next Big Sun is doing, we, we're actually gathering all this information, so it's, it's a, I would say the 100% of what is being sold on, on the market was being streamed. The, uh, the next thing we're, we're doing also is uh, tracking what consumers are doing online. So we have uh, very large panels of internet users and we're measuring uh, what, they, what they do, which site they're accessing, uh, what applications they are using when they go on a PC. Um, and to give you some examples, we can, we can see how many people go on a streaming service uh, where they're going before going on the streaming service, what they're doing afterwards, so maybe jumping from an artist's website to a streaming service, to then a uh, e-retailer to buy download music, and then going into a brand web page, etc. So that's a very comprehensive way of analyzing what uh, consumers are doing online. Um, and and uh, this is uh, based on, on panels I've said very large, like 200,000 people in the US, about 40,000 in the UK, 30,000 in Spain, Germany, France, Italy. We have the same in, in Brazil, um, uh, Australia, South Korea, Japan. So it's a very comprehensive way to understand what people are doing on the internet. So, and, and last thing we do, and we do that more and more, is, is analytics. Because beyond the data, uh, which is obviously extremely useful, you want to know What's the business case? What's happening? You, I have a, a business challenge. How can we answer that business challenge based on data? And we, we can extend more about this later on. So, I mean, really the difference between, I mean, you, you're very different from, from Next Big Sound in the sense that, you know, yours is much more exclusive data that's kind of hard to get hold of that requires, you know, your clients are not going to be so much, I guess, you know, the, the individual managers or whatever. They're going to be the kind of bigger labels and... Well, I, I would say the one thing is first, I, I believe that what Next Big Sound and, and Next Big Sound competitors and we are, what we are doing is, is very complementing to each other because they're in the social media space, we're not too much into that, except when we look at what I've described before, what people do on the internet based on our panels. Um, and, and the way I describe usually what we do is really two things. One which is tracking for right holders. So, so, and is that tracking for reporting purposes? Or for rights, reporting on the rights purposes. I would say when a PRO, for instance, a, a collecting for, a society, performing a, rights yeah, a collecting society, a collecting society, or a publisher or a right holder wants to know where his music is being used, for instance, 
we track that and report on that. Uh, same for the sales, it's comprehensive uh, sales data, we report uh, onto that. So yes, it's more exclusive. But then you have the, uh, the second part of the business that we're doing, which is very close uh, to what NextBizTan is doing, which is market insights. We, we bring into marketing team, promo team, uh, all the information they need to basically be more efficient, and more effective from a marketing standpoint. Um, uh, you, you've mentioned before, return on marketing investment, that's exactly what we, we're doing with our clients. Uh, uh, which is, is, that, is that more of a kind of a consultancy relationship? Is that more tailored? It's, it's two things. It's really bring the data to them so that they can do what they need with data in terms of understanding what's the impact of what they're doing from a, a sales and promo standpoint. Um, and when I've mentioned analytics before, it's very much exactly kind of a consulting role, which is helping uh, our clients to understand how they can better manage uh, what they are doing, or optimize their investments. Uh, um, and you were mentioning we're less working with uh, managers or uh, and, and more with the big clients. Well, I'd say no, we're working with everybody, obviously the labels, the collecting societies, the publishers, the radio stations, our main clients. Uh, but our data are available uh, to anybody. We've got websites to bring this data to clients, so it's very, very open. Uh, so some of the data is publicly available absolutely, to, yeah, yes, to everyone? Yes, yes. Yeah. There's no uh, exclusivity in the sense that I'm a small label or I'm a manager, I'm an artist, I can't access to the Nissan data. No, you can. You can. Okay. Thanks very much to, to Jean. And now let's move to the, uh, to the clients. Um, so um, maybe first... Uh, let's go to Jakob Hutel, um, the uh, Head of Legal and International Affairs at CODA in, in Denmark. And uh, Jakob, perhaps you could tell us a, a little bit about the, the kind of data services that, that you're using. Yes, yes, of course. Thanks, Paul. The first a bit of background, the CODA is the collective rights management organization in Denmark taking care of the performing rights for the uh, members that we have, the writers and the composers and the music publishers. It's um, the equivalent to ASCAP, to PRS, the Collecting Rights Management Societies that you might know. Denmark is a relatively small country, we're like five million inhabitants, but the collections that we have in Coda are, are getting nearer to 100 million euros a year, um, only for these performing rights. And, and there's a great responsibility connected to collecting that um, that, that, that money on behalf of our rights holders, because obviously we need to ensure and, and um, do our best to distribute that money as efficiently and, and basically as cheap and correctly as possible. It's a difficult balance to strike because we don't want to waste all the money in, in uh, getting it totally right, because then we distribute 10% and, and spend the 90 on administration. We don't want to do it um, badly in the sense that we do it so rough that we only spent a fraction of the money on identifying the rights holders because that's also not the right thing to do. So the balance is, is, uh, is there to be found. Um, we have an administration rate around 10% at CODA and for that money we, um, we, we have to do our best to distribute the money to the rights holders and this is where, this is where organizations like you guys come into the picture because you can help us um, with alternatives for the, the distribution um, basis or fundament. So Basically, who are you sorry. using? Who are you actually using right now? Well, um, we have a pilot with Nielsen. With Nielsen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we've also had a pilot with uh, other companies. BMAT is one of your competitors out there. Um, BMAT from Barcelona. Yeah. Yes. And, um, well, going back, a little, one, a little bit. We've got three areas where we, where we need data for what we do. Um, one of them is not really connected to what you'd normally think what we do uh, or what would be relevant for what we do, but it's, it's the media habits analysis that we, that we do. We've done it for a couple of years now, and it's, that is a, a data information that we commission in order to understand the market better. Because one thing is getting the money in, but you need to get the money in in a clever way. You need to understand the market that you're licensing. So we have media habits analysis telling us what the Danes using the music on a daily basis, how they feel about the new streaming services, how is, is uh, streaming cannibalizing radio, does that impact how we can license 
those two types of music services and so on. Um, what is the right, so what's that, the right price own, point for a... Your, sorry, is that your own primary consumer research? Yes. You commissioned yes. your own yes. research, yeah. Yes, and, we are, and that is something we're discussing with other collective rights management societies throughout the world to get a, um, a set of data that we can compare and see where are the differences between the different territories and the countries and, and the media habits. So we each learn more and more how the markets are, are licensed better. But that's just one of the three. The two others that I'm, um, that where we're using data is uh, for reporting and distribution. Normally it's the uh, obligation of a radio station or a TV station or a music user to report to us what they're using. It's the legal part of me feeling very hard about that. They have to tell us what they use. Unfortunately, it's not always the case. Um, sometimes some radio stations, TV stations have very poor data. And this is then where um, we can get data or, or buy data from uh, the service providers here next to me. And uh, that can be very powerful. And it, it also helps us in negotiations with the users about this reporting obligation. And that's um, an area that's changed over the years, right? I mean, you know, it used to be filling in individual cue sheets. And obviously with digital, it's got a lot more efficient. Of course, of course. And with the, with the really, with the, I'd say the good, the clever broadcasters, they're just, it's just a push of a button and then they send us the lists. And uh, because it's been, we would obviously be in a dialogue with them about how to put the list together, so it just just feeds directly into our system, in the in the most you know efficient manner, and then money is being allocated and distributed um, in that sense. The third area where we also um, get data is for tracking for income from abroad, abroad from our members. So in a way, it's, it's about auditing, it's about tracking what um, other collective rights management societies are doing on behalf of our members in their own countries. So every now and then, we, we try to get a, a, an idea about how are they performing, are we actually getting paid for the rights holders that we represent? And, and one way of doing that is getting data, um, uh, Comparing that to the money and the distribution that we get from abroad, and then we can have a dialogue with um, the relevant collective rights management society to see where the money went and and how come uh, it didn't get through. Yeah, so that's checking and auditing more, more than anything. And I guess you know all of this has helped you get to a position. I guess years ago it wasn't 10% your commission; it, it was it was a lot higher, I presume. And technology has helped you bring down your your rates or your commission. Yeah, n yes and no. I mean, we've been fortunate. We've been in the 10, 20, sorry, 10, 12-ish uh, for, for quite a while. Right. But we, we strive to do better. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, and now let's move over to um, Chris Carey uh, from uh, EMI Music and formerly at a collecting society at, at PRS, of course. Um, so Chris, um, tell us about uh, how you use data in your insight role day-to-day uh, -day at EMI. Um, hi, I'm Chris Carey. I'm Global Insight Director at EMI Records. Um, we've got a lot of different research tools we use in terms of kind of data and insight particularly. Um, we get market data, so we'll look at what's going on at, uh, at the highest level with music, be it streaming versus downloads versus physical um, across all markets. So that'll be either from IFPI. We're also getting data from Screen Digest to look at how um, mobile and broadband are changing because as the consumption patterns change, it's important to understand the technology trends and we forecast with that, so we hope we're moving with the market there. We also look at other media, so media pay for music, so film, TV, computer games, that kind of thing, um, DVD sales. So we keep a, quite an eye at a high level on quite a lot of data, um, which we buy in externally. Um, we've then got our own consumer insight team who maybe have 12 or 13 people based out of London who serve us globally, but then usually got a country lead or two country leads in each territory who will use the insight they generate and make sure it's communicated effectively locally. Um, to give an idea of scale of this research, in the UK you can do a nationally representative survey with 500 people. EMI do 10,000 at a time every six months. So to give you a scale of how seriously we take this, we take it very seriously indeed. 
Um, we've done a million interviews globally in the last three years or so, um, covering 25 countries, which if you do the math means that at any point in time, 12 people in the world are filling in one of our surveys. Um, I must say, actually, as a company that does consumer research and try to come in and sell you some, and when I saw the extent of what you're doing, it, it is quite something. And I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is, it's pr pr probably more than most of the labels are doing. I mean, that's quite a quite what are the What are the questions on those surveys? Uh, go on, we'll get into that. <laughs> um, so, sorry, if we've got market data, we've then got survey data. We also do music testing, so we'll play music to people and see what they think of it. Take their feedback, take it through our consumer segmentation that we've got, which, again, is consistent across globally. Um, so that becomes another kind of way of perfecting artist routines, looking at which music connects with which people, and therefore changing behaviour in view of that. Um, and then we also get licensee data. So, for instance, Spotify and iTunes will provide us data on who's doing what on our service and how they're using it, um, which really brings them back more to my role. So I'll do the macro bit, the country bit. The consumer stuff someone else's, but I kind of get it. And then I run our big data team, so I've got 10 billion rows of data sat in a database back in London that is waiting for me when I get home. Um, how do we use it? What does it do? So it helps us optimize. Um, the segmentation is huge because a lot of analysis done on dem demographics. But it's much more interesting that I'm the, what do you want to know? That I'm the same age as someone or that I have the same habits as someone, which is what the segmentation does for you. You look at people who behave similarly and it becomes much more powerful than, OK, you're a 28-year-old bloke living in London. You're probably doing this, that and the other. Well, it's much more interesting if the guy I sit next to at work, and he's 57, but we listen to similar music. You'd much rather know we listen to similar music in a similar way than the fact that he's a bit older than I am. Um, in terms of how we use it then, so optimising marketing, optimising sales, and just trying to do the best for our artists, really. And do you find that your, uh, you know, everyone within the company is keen and eager to have this data, or is it a bit of a job to actually make them, you know take it seriously enough and... Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that when EMI Insight was first established, we're jumping back about four years, there were, there were barriers to overcome. You've got to build confidence in the data you've got. You've got to be confident that you're asking the right questions, that you're getting solid answers to those questions. And then the killer bit, that you're interpreting it right. And so if I tell you Emily Sanday overperforms with guys over 35, is that good news or bad news? Because she's underperforming somewhere else in view of that. Is it that she's kind of doing particularly well with that group, and is that a group we want to go after? Or is it actually we've underperformed with the other groups and therefore need to kind of enhance them? So that interpretation and the confidence of that interpretation has really been built over time. Um, but it's fair to say now at EMI, it is very well trusted, very well used, and used consistently across major territories. And are you using any of the sort of next big sound music metric type data? Uh, yeah, so we get data in from music metric that sits in a dashboard for our artist launch team, which will track, so they'll track events, they'll track streams, YouTube, um, the sensible stuff that's been said already. Again, put it in a dashboard so it's easy to use, and that will be pushed out across the business. Um, they look at stuff at a fairly high level, so the distinction between their team and my team is that they'll tell you what's going on with overall streaming. If you want to get the demographics and things, you probably come more to me and go through it. And Marie, Marie Lise is nodding, which can only be a good thing. So, yeah, I mean, your impression now, uh, amongst other labels as well, is that this is getting quite ingrained in terms of, you know, at least the, the, the major labels. Uh, what, about, what about, I mean, do you have much traction with the ind independent labels? Because, you know, sometimes it is a bit of a luxury, let, let, let's face it, in terms of, uh, you know, your, your priorities. And, you know, if you can't afford barely a few hundred pounds on a digital marketing campaign, then, you know, can you afford to be subscribing to, to this kind of high-level service? I think we've watched over the last three or four years uh, sea change happen with... Uh, literacy around data in the music industry and it still is the I have a very self selecting crowd that comes to next big sound these are people that have been trying I think the first foot in the door is um, recognizing that they need to track this data and so when we came around people were writing all these numbers down by hand in word documents or Excel trying to track this stuff so if we can save a lot of time that's the usually the foot in the door and then once you start getting used to seeing these numbers on a regular in, uh, basis in your inbox, you can start seeing cause and effect between the marketing actions you're taking and the results that, that happen across the board. So it's label by label, and then it's individual within those labels uh, in terms of familiarity and, and dexterity with the data. OK. Um, I'm going to come out to the uh, audience now to make sure that we have got some time for questions. So I'm going to do my roving bit. Um, if you just like to 
put your hand up if you, if you have a question and, uh, and identify yourself when you ask a question, which will be helpful. Uh, oh, we have a roving mic. It's all right. I don't have to. I can rest my legs. Hi there. Um, I'm Andy Teacher. I run a PR agency in London called Blackstock. I just wondered what the panel think about the use of BitTorrent data, just in terms of obviously adding a lot of granularity to uh, insight around demographics, tastes, location. You know, we've got Latin America waking up, India waking up, so knowing what people are downloading and interested, obviously, one would think would be very useful for, for labels and everyone. So I'd just, just be interested to, to see from the panel what, what you guys think and um, you know, how you think that data could be interpreted for, uh, for, for good use. Who wants to go with that? I mean, you know, data from, from, from piracy uh, as well as... Uh, yeah, know, I mean, if, if I understand correctly the question, what, what you want to know is um, if, if we can segment or if we can find very granular information about what consumers or which consumers are, are listening to what kind of music and from where. And that's something we, we're doing, for instance, in the US. You know, I, I mentioned before the, uh, the uh, internet consumer panel that we have where we can track exactly what people are doing online from going on a streaming website or downloading music or going on Facebook because they, they are a fan of a, of a band. Uh, at the same time, we get to see what other things they do online, like going on a brand. So from that extent, we can, through this artist insight, see that this segment of consumers like this type of artist or this artist specifically, and they, they do other things. So that's being used by brands, by agencies, by the labels too, uh, who want to know how they can uh, better address this, uh, these consumers and, 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 and do the right promo and marketing things with these consumers. And, and it's also used when they want to seal a deal with, uh, with a brand, for instance, to make a co-marketing co or, or sponsoring or branding. Um, in terms of the piracy, I mean, I think, I think it's a good signal depending on what you're trying to do uh, in the business. Um, there's two knocks against it, though, is trying to resell that to an industry. They don't want to pay to see how many people are stealing from them. That's kind of been the 10 plus years uh, at the labels uh, fighting that. But as a, the other thing is, you know, Big Champagne's been pioneering this for, and championing it for P2P data for 12, 14 years. The thing about pirates and piracy is they don't like to be tracked. Um, and so it, it is hard to really uh, understand and be confident in the data that you're getting. If you do have a source and you do trust it, then it's an interesting signal. But again, it depends. If you're trying to sell music, it might not be a strong signal. If you're trying to route tours, maybe better. Isn't it? I mean, it's a very granular source of data, and surely in this kind of market, what you want is something that's reliable. And, and you, you can go through things like Facebook, but it's never going to give you that same level of detail you can get from the, the, you know, the billions of data points you're going to get in, in the BitTorrent um, sphere, surely. I, I think it depends what you can draw from it. So the question is really, is it valuable data? To which the answer has to be, if you had nothing else, yes, and it would be invaluable data. I think the... The data we get currently, the certainly stuff I sit on and get to work with, is granular and it's of music fans engaging consistently over time. And I think I'd prefer, if I'm trying to sell music, then I would rather look at iTunes data. By transaction, a, by zip code. Yeah, by transaction, by zip code, in granular detail, I get demographics for Spotify um, down to a track level. I can do, I can do a lot with it. I would say actually to have credible, clean data from a supplier we're working closely with is much more helpful to me, certainly in the current role, than the pirate data. But I, I wouldn't say it's valueless. I would just say that at the moment, I'd much rather see it coming from my iTunes feed. Attitudes have changed, though, haven't they? I mean, you know, I remember speaking with Eric at Big Champagne years ago when it was like no one was able to even declare publicly that they were using the data because they were worried about how that might be perceived when they're trying to have legal action taken against the, the sites in the, at the same time. I think now everyone's grown up a little bit more, and whether it has, as you say, you know, the same value or not, it's, 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 it's being used to a degree, right? Yeah, I mean, we've certainly got a feed of it. We certainly have a look at it. Um, and when unusual events happen, so Emily Sande plays the Olympics, we'll look at not only what happened on Spotify and iTunes, but also have a look to see what spiked elsewhere. Just my, my reply to the question would be that why wouldn't it be interesting for an artist to know what, what the fan base is, is listening to or downloading? regardless of the, of the source. Of course, it's, it's, 
nice to know that the music has been downloaded from a legal source, but it, it would still give you a very clear picture about your fan base to know what's being, being downloaded through BitTorrent sites. The surveys that have been done in Denmark show very clearly that what's being downloaded in BitTorrent very clearly reflects the, the, uh, the charts. I mean, what's popular, is, what's popular on the radio, on iTunes, is popular on, on BitTorrent. It's not that different. It's, 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 it's music, it's people are coming there for the music, and, and it's just another source of, uh, of music for these people using BitTorrent. But they basically have the same taste as people using the legal sources. Okay, uh, that was a good question, though. I like that. Um, have we got uh, another question from the audience? Don't be shy. No? Oh, oh, well, hello over there, Martin. A data uh, man himself. <laughs> um, hi, Paul. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my question is, um, uh, I'm from the official charts company. We compile and aggregate all the sales and streaming data for the UK. Um, my question is, um, uh, to, the, to the labels, really, is, you know, there, there's vast amounts of data now being collected by lots of different types of organisations. Um, we're already finding that there is a danger that labels become smothered in data. There's so much of it. Um, and I just wonder, from, from your perspectives, whether that is becoming an issue. And, al and also, actually, you know, um, d what happens when you do find yourself with so much data, costing so much, you need more people to process it, more people to analyse it. What's the kind of, what's the, what's the end conclusion of that? Yep, another good question. We were talking about this earlier on. Um, so, from our side, from my perspective, we've got, if you broadly think, three tiers of users. So you've got your absolute crazy heavy users who sit and can access the 10 billion rows of data very, very quickly and easily um, in Excel. And they know what they're doing. Pivot table, you're away. If you don't know what pivot table is, this isn't for you. That's all right. Um, country leads then are on next level down. So they're country experts, but they're not at the same level of expertise as kind of my team, essentially. And then you've got the tools you push out to everybody, which is much more summary data. It's much more about this is in a nutshell, what you absolutely need to know, rather than everything you could possibly want to know. I mean, it's interesting you talk about being smothered by data. I mean, I often find I'm getting smothered by context. That people say, well, OK, that's a great number, but what's the context? And you go back with the context, what's the context? And you go back for the context of the context, and you get to the context of the context of the context. And the risk is that actually, because data is so available and people are so happy now asking for it, we're at a really weird point where having been fighting to get data to be part of the conversation, we're now fighting to optimize the part of the conversation it maintains, rather than have it be the entire conversation. I mean, so one of the other dangers with being, having all this data available, I get person-level data from Spotify, demographics, all sorts, really, really helpful. But at the moment, it doesn't accurately reflect the physical market. So if I run into my marketing meeting and only talk about Spotify, because I've got all this granular data and I can tell you all about who did what and when they did it, well, I've missed the point. And really, I think, the, big, the biggest risk probably with the volume of data available is that we can't wait appropriately how, much e how important each stream of, of insight is. And the, the fun part about it is it changes over time, the different data sources that are relevant and what you need to pay attention to, the market shifting. So we have uh, our data science team. These guys have PhDs in physics and you know, crazy stats backgrounds. But instead of going more complex, the product needs to get simpler. And that's what we've spent the last year and millions of dollars investing to simplify things. Um, that was um, kind of the opposite of what I expected the platform to become. Um, but it's dialing it back. What are the four key performance indicators for your band at any one time? Um, how do you set those? How do you have the whole organization from the marketing team to radio set those numbers that really drive their business and understand what those are? how those change over time, and how those are different by artists. So it's, it's harder to be simpler, um, but I think that's going to be the key to, to navigating this. I think sometimes we, you know, we, we might forget where we were you know, with an industry that before the only means of data capture was a little card inside the, the, you know, the vinyl the CD, wasn't it, you know, in, in terms of actually knowing who the consumer was. So I guess we're, kind of, we're better off now than, uh, than, than where we were anyway. Um, Right, another question uh, from, from the audience, please. Who'd like to ask something? Don't be shy, come on. Nobody, I don't, I don't believe nobody's got a question. Ah, yes, over there. A very provocative question. Uh-oh. Um, 
We like those. So, no. If it's stupid, you can tell, don't worry. Um, where, where are you what, from? So we from know. Brazil, sorry. I'm from Abramos, from Brazil, a collecting society in Brazil. Um, what, in your opinion, is more valuable nowadays? Music or data? Music. That's not promotion, that's easy Music. to answer. You sure? Um, in spite of my job depending on it, yes. I guess my job depends on both, really, doesn't it? But, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if you haven't got music that's valuable, what do you use the data for if you can't ever monetize the music? There's, um, well, that's, we'll joke sometimes with our clients about, or I've heard companies pitch them saying, we won't pay you, we'll just give you data back and being paid in data. And, uh, that doesn't go far for salaries or uh, growing a business. I think eventually, you know, there's a lot to be unlocked and, and value to be created from the data, but we're just at the very beginning of, of understanding uh, the power and all that it can be done. I think it would be a brave person that, that sat here and said, you know, that the, the data was actually more valuable than the, uh, than the content. But to misappropriate a, a friend's uh, quote, Content is king, but data builds empires. That's a, you know, hey, do you like that? Yeah, yeah. I don't know quite whether it's true, but it sounds Chris Cass. I'd better credit him. Um, right, um, yep, gentlemen down here. I think we're all, I'll come. Uh, there was a brief uh, discussion about BitTorrent sites and illegal, illegal downloads of music. Um, how far does this copyright issue go? At the moment, you can post something on YouTube, and then you get notified about your, uh, you know, the video you posted has some song in it which has potential copyright issues. Uh, you post something on SoundCloud where you sing along to a song, and then you get notified it's been pulled back because of some automated process, identify the fingerprint of the song. Uh, how, how far is this going to go, where people just want to just want to be able to enjoy the music, maybe sing along to their popular tracks that they have on their iTunes libraries, uh, without and share it with their friends, maybe on Facebook or wherever? It's a little bit off topic, but but maybe do you want to? Yeah, I think there's a well, the, the copyright issue and the legality and the illegality is one question. But if you look at the fingerprint, fingerprinting technology as, as the core of the, issue, of the problem there, something being misidentified as being a copyrighted track and, and it wasn't really copyrighted, so why is it being pulled down by this uh, automatized fingerprinting method or, or, or policy? I think that's, that's a problem we're facing on a daily basis because in the, when we're trying to automatize Automize the the um, the technology of getting proper reporting in from what music is being used out there, be it YouTube or be it you know at a discotheque or at a cafe or wherever. There's a huge cost at actually getting the reporting in for that kind of usage. So we have to rely on proxies and what we think is being played out there. But the ideal thing would be to have just you know a, a second by second. Um, recorded, automatically matched, fingerprinted, and then it spits out lists and lists of lists of what's re actually being played on YouTube or in the discotheque or wherever. But uh, just my point is that the fingerprinting technology will never be smarter than what's already in the database. So you constantly need to feed the database with whatever new tracks are being created out there. And the, and the, the, the very concrete problem that we face when we acquire data from uh, service providers like yours, is that the, there's an over-representation of international hit repertoire, or you could say an under-representation of, of coda repertoire in those fingerprinting databases. So, so if we acquire, it's a practical example, we acquire um, a, based on fingerprinting, lists of being played of what is being played in, in MTV in Denmark. Unless we do something about the fingerprinting database, we only get hits, uh, or we only get lists of what is being played, and it looks like it's only international repertoire being played, because that is the only thing the system knows. So we have an issue of making sure that the data is available for the fingerprinting uh, of, of the tracks out there. I think that YouTube's uh, ingestion engine and the fingerprint matching is one of the most 
fascinating, incredible technology uh, solutions that's uh, kind of untalked about, but just the how much volume they're ingesting and how quickly they can tag it. And I think that it's, you know, a, it's a game of cat and mouse a little bit, but in a way, um, it's brilliant because they're compensating rights holders and it's just about identification. So they've actually set up now a feed for us and Nielsen uh, on detection. So knowing that how many times is poker face used in a cat video in the background. Um, and I think that's those, the volumes on those track detections are, could be higher than on the official channel even. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, my, my question was more in, in relation to um, we, like we had an experience where something was uploaded to SoundCloud and there was an automated message from SoundCloud saying that uh, the copyright owner of a particular track has forced us to remove this track off SoundCloud because they detect because they were notified by SoundCloud that their song uh, or their copyrighted material was being shared on SoundCloud by somebody. Uh, so they automatically pulled it. I, I mean, I think we'd agree that the technology for the fingerprinting has to, has to work and has to be appropriate. But I think oh, the, 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 role, the role for data here probably is informing that database so that it, it acts as it should in the first instance. I mean, unfortunately, with anything new, with new technology, there will be teething problems along the way. I always joke I'm a late adopter of technology. My iPhone 5 won't get to me for another couple of years. Still got the 3, still got to keep going. Because if it ain't broke, you know. But I think there's a right place for getting the technology right. But we've got to accept there'll be some hiccups along the way. OK, let, let's, uh, let's move on, gentlemen, there with, with the microphone. Thank you. Uh, Francisco from Colombia, Colombian label, Tropical Music. The question is for Alex. I missed uh, two years ago the competition. And I was not able to, to see you win. Uh, at that time, how did you perceive the music industry that led you to create uh, the next big sound? And how has it changed since? Great question. Um, I'll keep it short. But uh, I worked at major labels and was stapling sound scan reports every Wednesday morning for executives and saw what they were looking at, CD sales information, radio spins, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of great data, a lot of reports. But I watched my peers. Uh, listening to music in a lot of different ways that wasn't represented. And so I actually went out on the road tour managing a band for two months and was tracking all these numbers by hand in Excel, going to MySpace and iMeme and iLike and all these sites that don't exist anymore and uh, trying to graph them. But I would spend all my time collecting this data and none of it actually analyzing and making sense of it. So I started tracking MySpace data for Akon one night uh, with my co-founders. And between the hours of 2 AM and 8 AM, he had 500,000 plays that happened um, online. This is 2009, and uh, I knew this was a staggering amount of activity that wasn't tracked by the industry. And turns out uh, that when we started tracking it, the, the attention and, and business pickup and everything has just grown from there. And we just listen to our customers who tell us very forcefully which data sources to add next, what they want to do with it, how, uh, what decisions they're trying to make and how to build products that support it. And those data sources change very quickly, don't they? I mean, you know. Yeah, I think virtually. only one of the, yeah, my sp uh, of the first five sources we integrated, I don't think we track any of them anymore. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Henning, I'm an artist manager. I manage bands that release uh, globally, and what I would like to look at is uh, collecting societies and all this conversation about data capture. Uh, I find collecting society somewhat old-fashioned in, in the way they pay out the artists. It's uh, you know, very delayed. There's obviously great potential for using this new technology. And how is that conversation going with collecting societies? Are they uh, trying to sort of build a system that they all can tap into to get data, to get artists paid quicker and in a more direct way? And yeah, what is their reaction? Are they supporting you? Are they just completely blocking everything off, or how's it going? Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> um, what we do is that we, I was speaking in the beginning about the balance of the cost of distributing, and, uh, and, and the, on one side, and then the balance of what kind of service we want to provide to our members and the rights holders we represent. So whenever there's a demand from the rights holders that we need to speed up distribution processes, we look at it. 
and, and we discuss it and, and presentations are being made to the board who, who in the end will be deciding whether we should spend the extra money on upping our distribution frequency or keep it at the level where it is. So it's, it's, it's member driven and it's member decided in that way. What we're doing in online now is that we have quarterly distribution. Um, when, when the, which is, and in, which is, uh, which is, how do you say, it? in the past it was annual distribution, even in online. So now we have quarterly distribution in online. Um, I don't see why we wouldn't make monthly or weekly distribution in the future when the system supports it. When micro payments or micro distributions actually don't have any uh, extra variable costs to them, just, it's just money being paid out. That would be, that would be wonderful also from, I suppose, from the member's perspective. It's, it's um, basically we, we do it, we want to do what is being asked by us from the members as a service, and we just have to do it as efficiently as we can within, you know, within reason. Um, you've got to remember these uh, big legacy systems and so we're three years old and we've already done three kind of tech migrations in the database structures to support it. I was talking with um, Thomson Reuters and they started in 1896. Reuters would row out, row out to the boats coming in from America, get the news and transmit it throughout Europe. And they would think about the, the legacy issues uh, there. He was saying even that um, they had pigeons that they would send, carrier pigeons with message and they would send two pigeons at once for redundancy uh, sake. But all the tech migrations that have had to happen and just the speed at which the world evolves, you know, all the technologies we're using weren't around. And when you're talking with money and dispersing things, uh, you know, at first when I started the company three years ago, I was like, why aren't these daily payments being made, you know, internationally based on actual data, um, but learning how these infrastructure systems work, um, I have more sympathy. I think just thinking from a publisher's point of view as well, you kind of might have to be careful what you wish for there because if you get daily data for a thousand songwriters, you have to match back to things. There will be an optimal level of data you want to receive in the end as well. But I definitely agree. There's that trade-off between fast and slow, accurate and not, cost of accuracy in there. And I think I would, I hope Jacob doesn't mind me saying, Code would do it very well from either three and a half years at PRS and we often would phone up and say what's going on and have these discussions. It, the discussions are definitely taking place. Yeah, and and the, the role of PROs is changing a lot. You, you see some more advanced in some countries, at least in Europe. Um, they have new um, reporting and distribution systems. They got one single file coming com from a company like Nielsen or others, basically. They predict in advance what they're going to pay based on all the, the files they receive because they got this one single file from all the radio stations. Um, and once they got the money in, they can get the money out extremely quickly. And you can see that if that happens in some country, like the UK, the, the same trend uh, is happening in the rest of Europe. Uh, and that's going to go you know, step by step. It's, uh, as Alex was explaining, it's also a question of, at some, at some point, uh, starting from, from, from uh, scratch with a new system and, and getting rid of the, the old system, basically. Okay. I think we've got time for one more, one more question from the, uh, from the audience. Was that a, half, a, a full hand, a half hand? Yep, OK. Hi, uh, my name is Dudi and this is Kami. We are from Montreal. Let's say we are artists, we are, we are an artist and uh, you don't have um, a big team working with you. We're doing, you know, we have to track data, we have to co a compose music and, you know, there's, there are so many data. How can we be efficient? And if we don't have a, a prof professional to help us taking the right decision accord according to the data, what advice can you give us, you know, in, uh, like this? I think just starting to become familiar with the data that's available. So you put your music online on any one of the different profiles and sign up. And, you know, with my company or any tool, you can pull in that data and start looking at it. And it's just about running experiments because the secret is that no one has any idea what's going on and how to navigate things, and it's just about trying and measuring things efficiently. So might run one week, say, is it more efficient if I send emails to my fans or if I post on Facebook and measuring week to week how you do it, or should I print posters and hang them up around the Montreal, or should I uh, make T-shirts, or should I buy Facebook ads? And each week, if you track that, you can see in a line graph where the spikes occur and start analyzing what happened there, what happened uh, if it didn't work, then let's try something else. 
and kind of little by little each, each week starting to look at that data and understand what you're trying to accomplish. If it's just getting your name out there, what are the big, uh, you might just care about total numbers, um, but as soon as you have your fan base, you'll want to move more into engagement and ultimately sales and monetization. But just start with kind of the big four or five sites, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and then uh, see what works and where your fan base is. Thank you. I, I just say as well, don't try four things at once, because you'll never, I mean, we have it with all the data we use, that there are, I dread to think how many things influencing Katy Perry sales at the moment. Trying to isolate factors is an absolute nightmare. And so just for your comfort level, literally take, take one thing and do it once and see how it goes. And maybe do it a second time, see how it goes. So you've got now a benchmark for, all right, if the two numbers are about the same, you know it has about that impact, and you can be comfortable with that number. You can then do something else, leave it a week, see what it did, do it again, make sure the numbers are consistent. If you see massive differences in numbers and you can't explain it, do it a third week and see which was the right number to benchmark against. So you can start to get a feel for what should happen when you do activity A, B, C, or D. Work your way through till you've worked out, OK, the most powerful thing for exposure is X. The most powerful thing for getting plays on SoundCloud is Y, whatever it might be. Once you've worked out which the most powerful ones are, you can start having some fun combining them and seeing whether you get twice the impact by doing two things at the same time. But I mean, I mean, you've got a data science team. I've got statisticians kind of nearby. The reality is you can do it in Excel and just go, all right, 30 this week based on that, same as last week based on the same thing. If I add this in, what happens? Do I get 30 more? It, it actually isn't as complicated as we try and make it sound. And there are lots of free tools out there, you know, Google Analytics and Facebook's own data that they provide. There's a lot that you can do without having to spend a penny. Just have someone in the band who's prepared to be a bit nerdy and look after that, because obviously you don't want it to get in the way of the most important thing. But as, you know, as long as someone can put in a little bit of time to make use of that, you don't have to be necessarily paying for any other services on top. And just set aside a time for yourself. Our traffic days are you know, biggest traffic days are Monday when people are planning out their week and reviewing the week before, or Friday when they're reviewing what happened that week. Um, so just stick with the time and try lots of different things sequentially and see what works. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, um, I think we'd probably better wrap up there to give, uh, give you a chance if you want to come and uh, say hello personally to, to these guys. But please, could you show your appreciation uh, for some uh, wonderful participants there? Thank you.